Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk. Uh, these talks are live every Friday but at 1 p.m., both here in the building and live online. So whether you are in Bristol or far away, uh, hello to all the people on camera, uh, you can join in the conversation. So my name is Martin. I am the studio's creative technologist. I'm a white man with uh, brown hair, uh, going a bit bald on top, wearing uh, blue jeans and a white t-shirt. Uh, and every Friday, we throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday. This is your chance to spend some time in the space, hot desking alongside our residents from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we have our lunchtime talks, which cover everything from innovative research in the fields of creativity and technology, projects in progress, things that are in, in need of feedback, questions, and curious minds. Now, an especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio. Is anyone new to the studio? Stick your hand in the air. Welcome, oh, plenty of people today, oh great. Well, uh, for those of you who've heard this bit before, you might want to take a moment and you know, share things on social media, tell people that this is happening, people can join in live. I'm not gonna force you. Uh, those of you who haven't heard about the studio, what is the Pervasive Media Studio? Uh, we are a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. I feel like I've said that phrase so many times <laughs> in the last two years. It just, it just trips off the tongue now. Uh, we're a partnership between Watershed, University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. And we offer studio space, desks, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities for our residents, all for free as part of our spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And most of all, we're a space for people to take risks in their practice, uh, embryonic ideas, and make time for collaboration. So quick bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Do feel free to move around, make a cup of tea, uh, grab a glass of water from the kitchen, there's some coffee on. Uh, please don't use the microwave, it interferes with all sorts of electronics when you do that. Uh, we have a quiet space just through this wall, just around the corner, so if you need to take a break at any point, you can just pop in there. Fire exits are at either end of the studio. We have no fire drills planned. Uh, we don't usually schedule them during lunchtime talks. Uh, <laughs> if the fire alarm goes off, that's real. Please follow a member of the studio team. Um, and we have accessible toilets and baby change facilities in the cor corridor next to the kitchen. Uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end of this talk. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, if you want to pop your questions into the YouTube chat, if you're in the building, you can just stick your hand up. It's fine. Uh, if you want to get news on all of our future talks, you can head to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio or at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or, you know, just ask one of us, we'll, we'll tell you. Uh, so yeah, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. We are delighted to welcome creative co-producers Neville Gavey and Philippa Bailey uh, to share their project, Living Language Land, uh, a journey through endangered and minority languages that reveal different ways of relating to land and nature. The talk's gonna be about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Neville. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, actually, we'll probably talk for about 20 minutes because we're really hoping to have a, you know, a nice conversation with you about I, where I we want to really have asked that project. question before I said it, didn't <laughs> I? <laughs> anyway, I'm Neville. I'm, I'm white, um, wearing jeans and a green T-shirt. I am roundish, baldish, middle-aged, and I'm um, very, very happy to be here to share our project with you. Um, should I say, should I introduce myself as well? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Philippa Bailey and um, co-producer with Neville of this project and I'm uh, quite tall, uh, middle-aged-ish, um, wearing a flowery skirt and a white top. Okay. So uh, my background is very much as a visual artist. I met Philippa when Philippa was managing the Cabot Institute at Bristol, Bristol University where I was an arts in residence. Um, but what we really wanted to talk to you today was about living language land. And as has already been said, uh, it's, a, it's a journey through minority and endangered languages which reveal a different way of relating to nature and our environment and really introduce quite different concepts in many cases to how we relate and deal with the, the, the world around us. Um, I mean, I guess if you're thinking about crops, lots of us think about this kind of crops that are planted and, and the dangers of monocrops where one thing dominates and all other others are lost. Well, language is very similar in the sense that, you know, with the few languages now dominating most of the conversations around the world. 
so many concepts, ideas, uh, thinking, knowledge actually is lost when we lose language and that's something we were quite keen to address. So the project literally uh, came about because we were funded by the British Council um, to do something in the lead up to COP26 and in the lead up to that period we shared 26 words from uh, different communities around the world. Um, it doesn't cover the whole world by any means. You couldn't possibly do that. Um, but I, I think with each word we shared, um, actually we invited people to share the meaning of a word entirely uh, on their own terms and in their own voice and in their own methodology. So some people shared um, pieces of written text, Others shared um, photographs, a lot shared small uh, films and video clips, but it was really important that we created a platform which was people sharing entirely in their own voice. So it's, it's, you know, it was really about trying to give, well, reciprocity in terms of a relationship, but also give people an opportunity to give, have some visibility. So, I mean, before we begin, I want to say thank you to everyone who contributed because they made some wonderful contributions and. Uh, through COVID, when we were all locked in our homes, we had the most extraordinary conversations and journeys with people around the world. It was fantastic. Yeah, and I'm going to go into telling you a little bit more about that. Um, and just to pick up on some of the threads that Neville was talking about with language, um, I guess what really engaged us with this project is this idea that language grows out of a place. So, you know, the world has more than 7,000 languages, and that reflects, to some extent, the diversity of places where people live um, around the globe. And in the pictures on the left-hand side in the top, you've got the very rainy Paramos, the sort of moorland um, of, uh, of Colombia around Bogota. And uh, at the bottom here, you've got a watering hole in northeastern Namibia in the land of the Quay people, the Quay Sambushman people. So of those 7,000 languages in the world, about 40% of them are endangered. And just 23 languages count for half of the world's population. Um, of course, the picture is more complex than that because lots of people, especially outside this country, speak many languages and, um, and experience the world through, through their different languages. But nonetheless, we're heading towards that domination by a small number of languages that start to shape how the conversations are happening around the, around the world. And what we really felt in relation to um, the climate crisis and, the, and biodiversity and environmental crises is that English is such a dominant language in that space, you know, both in terms of climate activism, but also in terms of climate policy uh, and politics. So, um, you know, one of our questions was what's being squeezed out as English takes over that space and what other knowledge and understanding might we be able to, um, to learn? So the other part that I wanted to touch on with language is this idea of language as a relationship. So language expresses the relationship of a person to their place um, and all the elements in that place. And it also expresses the relationships between all of those elements, so between the river and the sky or the bird and the, and the trees. Um, and, and in many languages, that includes lots of elements that are unseen, you know, so not parts of the material world, but all of the spirit world is also in the language. And so, you know, the language is an amazing way into seeing somebody's worldview, what they call their cosmovision, you know, how, how does it all fit together in your language? And hopefully some of the examples that we share with you today will um, light that up for you a little bit. Um, on, on the screen now you can see a picture of a tree with the word Wiyokchan on it. Um, and what I'm going to do now is we, we just we thought we'd talk you through very briefly four of the words which have been contributed, just to give you a kind of sense of what they feel like and the richness of the conversation. So this word, Wiyokchan, was shared to us by a man called Teokasin Ghost Horse. He's a Lo Lakota speaker from South Dakota. Um, and again, we had the most extraordinary conversation with him about words and language because he told us that actually the Lakota language is a lang language almost entirely uh, written in verbs. They don't use nouns, they use verbs. Everything in their language is, is active, is, is moving, is connected. So, um, you know, a tree is treeing, it is being a tree, literally. It, uh, you know, a lake is laking. And, and uh, beyond them all being active, and I mean, he described it as a quantum language, which I thought was really interesting. But it really, that concept completely changes your thinking about the world outside your window, actually, because um, where we use nouns, they use verbs. So 
a tree becomes an object very much as kind of, it's a thing, it's separate, it's not connected to us in a way. Whereas if it's treeing and we're connected to it very, through quantum language, it's, it's something very alive, very tangible. And um, that was, uh, that's a concept I thought was really mind-blowing. It changed my thinking profoundly. Um, and I think the other thing that he also said which was really interesting is that there is no hierarchy in their language at all. So every, everything, every object, every person has equal weight. So if you're a, a, a dog or a person or a fly or a cat uh, or a tree, um, they're of equal kind of value. It's, can't insult by calling someone, you're a dog. It's not an insult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, again, I just thought that's a really wonderful and powerful concept and something um, we've shared with in words in a, in a, and a small film in our project, but a concept we really want to think about, how could we open that up more, explore it more widely? Yeah, so moving on from what Tiokasun shared, this is a word siwa, and the picture here is of somebody making an offering into a lake um, in the Paramos in Colombia. Um, it's from the Muisca language, which is the um, indigenous language of Bogota, of the Bogota area, um, and shared with us by um, a, a, a Muisca community there. And what Siwa means um, is not just lake or pond, but it also means the vagina of a woman, because in the Muisca language and in the Muisca um, cosmovision, it's from the lake that the first woman emerged, and she was called Mother Bashwe, and she was carrying the first man um, as a baby in her arms. So they say, from the waters emerged Mother Bashwe, who gave birth to our people and taught us how to live well in our territory. The waters sing stories. Siwa speaks to us and reminds us of the humidity of our first vessel, our mother's womb. And, and that relationship between the body, between our own bodies and features that we can see in the landscape, I think is a really amazing um, and empowering idea. And it also helps us to understand what an incredible um, trauma it was when, uh, when the conquistadors arrived in Colombia and started to drain the lakes because um, they saw that there, was, that there was gold and treasure that had been made as offerings into the lakes and they wanted to get their hands on that. And that, for, for the Muisca, was the, that, that place was the origin of life. Um, and I think also in our contemporary society, how we think about our bodies in relationship to the earth is really important. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and another word I thought I would share is the word Malocca. So on the screen there's a picture of a, what's a, it's a, it's a night shot of uh, what looks like a, a, a kind of very, very large uh, building made out of kind of reeds, grasses, uh, with people gathered inside. Uh, so Malocca is uh, from the Colombian Amazon, and the word really literally describes a, a longhouse. But I think what's, it's much, much more than that. Actually, the Malocca is where the whole community gather together for social, spiritual, and uh, practical um, discussions. It's, it's the place where uh, everything is decided in relation to their environment, looking after the lakes, the trees, uh, looking after each other. And I think um, what is really, for me, was so important about this particular word was that all decision-making is made in the Malocca, and it's made by the community. And that notion of community decision-making, um, real democracy, I guess, is something which I guess uh, we could probably learn a lot from in the UK right now and in other parts of Western Europe. Yeah. So I think that, that for me became quite a powerful word and concept. I mean, it's interesting too that even when they shared the word Malocca with us, uh, apparently they spent several days in discussion as a community about which word they wanted to share. And I just think, you know, and, and then to share that was, uh, was a really powerful thing. Yeah, and something that I love about this word is that um, the contributor, Emperatriz Lopez, she said, protection for the forest comes from here. So I think um, we often carry an idea that, like, nature um, cannot be well where people are, that it's like wherever we are, we are the kind of scourge on the land and we cause problems. Whereas the way that they see it is actually the people are the source of protection from the forest, for the forest because without the people, there's nobody actively caring for the land around and it would be taken over and it would be... Um, you know, exploited. So we just want to show um, a short video here, which is actually two other contributions um, from the African continent. 
Um, and just to kind of um, echo what Neville was saying about how people shared in their own words and in their own ways about the, the, the words that were meaningful for their, from their language communities. So just... <laughs>
Um, just to point out, the image on the left here is a, is a, um, a piece of fabric art, uh, textile art, made by an artist in Canada who loved our project, and she actually made 26 pieces of art for every one of the words that we shared. In fact, she made 27 because she made this one of all the words together. Um, so, you know, it's been really um, inspiring for us, uh, that sense of reciprocity that we've tried to share something that was shared with us, and other people have responded with their own kind of gifts. And I guess some questions that we wanted to sort of bring alive with you guys, because you live in a different world, maybe from us, and are familiar with things that we don't know. Um, you know, we've been thinking about how could we extend this project into something that is much more like a felt experience. So, um, you know, we've, um, we've, as Neville says, we've got this collection of words that people have shared with us. They've shared them in their own voices. There's always audio, so they've, they've told us how, how do you say the word in their language. Um, uh, and then there's different, you know, different media to accompany them. But we're really thinking of like, what would a physical experience of some of these words and ideas be like? Mm. How might that be a multi-sensory experience and engage different audiences? How might it be something that is collective, so not that you're necessarily off in your own world, but that you're doing something together? And how could we also, you know, explicitly make it um, a decolonial project? Because, you know, it's very easy for us to try and go to other places in the world, take the pictures that we want to take and the video that we want to take and bring it back and try and create that experience. But that's not the experience of the person who is living in that situation. Um, and participatory, both in the sense of, of an audience participation, but also of the communities who've already shared things with us that, you know, we want them to be part of the ongoing conversation. Um, and I just put um, a screenshot here from, you might know um, Marshmallow Laser Feast's work, um, but creating an immersive experience for people in um, English woodland up in the Lake District, and somebody wearing a, a VR headset, but also having that tactile experience of like being in the forest and ha having bark on their, on their face. Yeah, I think um, just to echo a little bit of what Philip has said, you know, the website exists, it's there, it's a great resource. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of people about the project and how to extend it. We're working with quite a few educational um, groups, both for primary, secondary, and tertiary education, is how some of the elements of the project could be incorporated into kind of, you know, an, ed an educational curriculum. But we are really very keen to kind of think about other ways of sharing um, what we've got already and how we might extend it into the future with some of the many relationships we've built up around the world. So that's really why we're so grateful for this opportunity to be with you and to hear something of your experience, which is way beyond ours mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of the kind of digital and immersive uh, environment. Yeah, and we just wanted to finish with a little quote from another of our contributors. So, you know, if nothing else, we hope this half hour or whatever has been a rest restorative half hour. Uh, she, she said something that I feel is so affirming. Um, she says, we're, we're part of an interdependent circle of life. From generation to generation, our teachings say that the earth doesn't belong to us, but rather we belong to her, bearing in her our own distinctive roots. So, thank you so much. That's what we've got there. All right. Well, we have loads of time for questions. Yeah. Um, if there are any questions on, online, uh, Emma, not yet. All right. Uh, any questions in the room? We do have a microphone that you're going to have to speak into. You, yeah. uh, can somebody pass? <laughs> uh, I think Zoe here had a question. Uh, you're going to have to like hold it right up. Like, yeah, that's it. Like, hello making, everyone. Nicola and ice cream. Um, thank you so much, guys. That was so interesting. Um, yeah, I feel like I've really learned so much about you know, how language conditions the way that we are. I was really interested in what you were saying about how the English language potentially conditions how we think about climate solutions. And I wondered if you mm. have any more examples of that, um, yeah, like in the West. And also, like, is there anything that you found that like the English language offers that is good that <laughs> other languages don't? Like, is there something? Is there something to be salvaged from the way that we like communicate? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say on the, on the second point there, it's not a question of either or. I think it's just that we really, we force people um, who have, you know, a richness of, of concepts in their own language to explain those in English. So, for example, we worked with uh, different communities, one community in southern Chile, Mapuche community, who shared an amazing word with us, which is like their version of 
of biodiversity, but it's all of the seen and the unseen. It includes all the spirit world and the history in, in the sort of what makes up a place and the health of a place. And they have to call that biocultural diversity in order for that to become something that can be recognized in like a, an international, you know, in a grant or um, in, um, yeah, in a sort of policy document. Um, and likewise, we worked with a, a Quechua community in, in Peru. Um, they have something that's called the Potato Park. And when I first heard about the Potato Park, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Peppa Pig, but like they go to like Potato World and there's Mr. Potato. And I was sort of thinking along the like this kind of horrendous theme park idea <laughs> with potatoes. But actually, it's a, it's um, you know it's many communities who've been cultivating literally thousands of varieties of potatoes over um, over thousands of years and who um, care for that land and care for the, the different, what can be grown at the different elevations and facilitate the exchange between communities. Um, and again, that is framed within that sort of biocultural diversity. That's what we're preserving here. And I, I just think we, we need to create more space for people to be able to talk about themselves in their own language in the way that, that um, you know, suits them and make best efforts to translate that, but just kind of broaden the whole thing out. So I think English is, you know, it's great. It's got, it's very precise. It's a very analytical language. As Neville said, you know, it's very based around objects and nouns. So it can describe things in a very um, thorough way, but it lacks that, that relationality that other languages um, bring in. Um, yeah, I, th I think also, you know, when we're at COP26, all the climate summits are so dominated by, you know, um, you know the, the, the larger blocks, Western nations in particular. And I just think, Actually, if there was space, if, if we opened ourselves up just to listen, <laughs> um, there are so many lessons we could learn from communities who've been living in relation to environment very successfully for generations and to have knowledge and experience. So it's just about that listening. And I think sometimes uh, we, we kind of, we, we lack that. And I think, again, the other thing about English is we so separate the kind of scientific practical from the spiritual. And I think in most of the languages we've, encom mm. we've encountered in most of the conversations, those things are all wrapped up. They're one and the same. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that connection between those things is really important thing to, to kind of uh, reevaluate, I suppose. Yeah, maybe, sorry, you've just, you've unleashed quite a torrent <laughs> from our stories. <laughs> we've got loads of them. Um, Go for yeah. it. I guess something that we're interested in looking at is not just words, but also stories and metaphors and like a little bit, you know, more that how people, um, yeah, can convey um, concepts and ideas in, in sort of more than just words. So we're, we're mm. writing a grant at the moment with people at the University of Bristol around that. Um, and one thing that just comes to mind is, you know, um, we tend to fall back in in English, I think, and because of our, our cultural story, uh, uh, into a sort of battle of good and evil. And everything is sort of played out on a battlefield. And I don't know if you remember Boris Johnson um, talking at COP26 about you know, how it's the 11th hour and we're straddling the bomb and we've got to pull out the right wires. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's nothing like that. It's, there's, no, there's no bomb. There are no wires. There's no magic bullet. There's no single solution. This is about a way of living, and that's, I think, also what these languages and stories say, is it's about respect and about reciprocity and about understanding your place in the, in the greater picture of things. It's not about straddling a bomb and pulling out the right wires. And, 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 to, and while we keep telling that story, we will keep failing to make the kind of changes which are ultimately um, you know, a million tiny, boring changes that we have to do again and again and again not just here, but everywhere. Um, you know, it's a, it's a totally different kind of challenge that we face. So I think, yeah, also that the, the, the kind of the narratives and the stories are really important. So. Great. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, gentleman here. You can wave to the mic. Thanks. Um, yeah, that was really great. Um, I don't feel like I know too much about this stuff, but um, one of the things that kind of got me here was... Um, I was reading a Robert McFarlane book, um, something about the language being taken out of the dictionary, mm. uh, some of the words, yeah, um, and more of the words of uh, could call the profane and not the sacred. <laughs> you know, that s seems to stick out. But words from the about the land, or mm. uh, and, and then being replaced with the digital. Yeah. So. Um, 
it seems like I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are maybe around um, yeah the the world that we're going into like this like this idea that we have to embrace technology and it's we're going forward with that with algorithms and it's data and information far away from the, the sacred and the spiritual it seems a bit of a paradox as well that like we need we use that we are set and if it's we kind of I don't know. I'm stuck with that. It's mm. like a real yeah. sort of dilemma. Yeah. And um, so I just wondered what your thoughts are on around that. And um, yeah, just whether there's any action that can be taken with subverting language in any way. I don't know. You know, I mean, the dictionary, the, this idea that dictionaries come out every year with these new words mm. and taking the old ones out. How do we work against that possibly? Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. It's a question that I, I have as well. I mean, I think that, of course, there are incredible benefits of technology. We wouldn't have been able to communicate with many of the people we did without that technology, even though some might have had to travel you know, days or several hours just to get to somewhere where they could uh, connect online. So, of course, there are kind of amazing um, benefits that come with it. Uh, but it, it's with all of these things. It's a it's a it's a balance, and and how you achieve that. And uh, I guess I get part of the reason we wanted to, to come here and speak to you today. You were all part of that digital creative industry. Is how we strike that how we strike that balance exactly? Because you know, um, e even film has a sense of removing us from exactly what's outside the you know, the, the tactile earth outside the door and window. So is there a way of straddling it? Is there a way of combining it? Those are exactly the questions we wanted to kind of tease out with you to some extent. Yeah, and I think it really came alive for me. We were doing a session for, for teachers, you know, who are deeply invested in teaching about climate science in their, or, or climate change in their classrooms. And we presented some of this um, stuff to them. And one of the teachers who was an English teacher said like, you know, I work in urban Sheffield and I just, I can't quite see like how can we make the link across to my students because the worlds that they're living in through social media and through, you know, their everyday life are, are so far removed from that. And that kind of really shocked me because I was like, wow, if we've lost the ability to like, to speak about a relationship, say to trees, where trees provide the oxygen that we're breathing and we don't understand that relationship, that feels like, gosh, you know, <laughs> that's a massive challenge, you know. So I think there's, yeah, there's the digital worlds that we're, we're in and bridging across to those. I mean, and, and this is also where I'd be really excited to hear from you guys. We, you know, we've followed and we've tried to support lots of initiatives that are trying to change the narrative and trying to particularly put indigenous people front and center and their knowledge and say like, here are living alternatives to the climate crisis. Um, but you know, I don't know how far those narratives are like permeating. My sense is that there's a lot of activity in that space, but maybe that's just my Facebook feed and my Instagram <laughs> feed. So yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. I mean, what do you see in terms of the, the language that's being used in relationship to, to environmental change and environmental crisis? Are you seeing changes there? Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 please. Oh, yeah. please. yeah. I mean, what's coming up for me is that the, the, the forces, you know, the sort of 21st mm. century dark magicians, as I sometimes call them, like Mark Zuckerberg, um, <laughs> in which, you know, we, we're kind of, I know I have to be spellbound by the tech, by the yeah. magic of the 21st century. And it's kind of like the drug where it's, you know, people are on their phones all the time, et cetera, et cetera. So perhaps it's some, you know, uh, social drive. Mm. So strong mm. that that uh, the, the powers of that. Mm. Um, so maybe I don't know. Maybe it's something there, um, but it yeah. means checking ourselves. Yeah, yeah. First, you know, whether it's greed for the planet, or greed for us, or it's something about slowing mm. down in order to then get a sense of really what's happening in, in internally inside us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's so beautiful that you share it in that way and like come back to the emotion and the felt sense within each of us. I think um, I saw a little sign outside which says, you know, what does the world need more of? And I think like when we start from that good place in ourselves and we can also think like, what, yeah, what, what do I want to bring alive 
in the world? What do we need more of? And hopefully be really conscious about how we do that. Yeah, thank you. On, on a completely different project, I did a talk at the Journal of Space about three years ago. Um, we were talking about VR and various other things. And there was a member of the audience who said, if we've got virtual reality, why do we even need to protect the wildlife outside there? Because we can just, it's there, we can recreate it. And I thought, it's a kind of, <laughs> it's a kind of extreme <laughs> concept. But um, you know, I think those are things we need to think about mm. quite seriously. Alan. I think uh, online has a question. <laughs> <laughs> online has a name, this is Emma. <laughs> <laughs> It is Emma. Hi. Um, so Kat would like to ask, um, how do people respond to your work? Have you seen some people change their practice or approach to take more time to listen to the words and stories of other languages? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, people have, have responded in a very kind of heartfelt way to the work, I think. They have responded in a little bit how you, how you were saying, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but, sir, but um, you know, a little bit how you were saying about just sort of feeling it in their heart and feeling, I think, resourced by the project, which is kind of how we felt actually through lockdown and whatever in this time of sort of dislocation and disconnection, actually, this brought us in, into close contact with people. And that was reflected, I think, in, in um, the people that, that shared their feedback with us. Um, you know, I think some people are kind of like, they just love words and they get in there and they just, they find words really juicy and they want to know more about that. And um, I don't know if they've um, been able to incorporate those, but I know quite a few people who've, who've used the materials in their teaching, for example. Mm. So if they're teaching, um, you know, in the environmental humanities, for example, or yeah, language, um, they've, they've been able to work it into their, into their classroom materials and things, so yeah. Yeah, well, one of the kind of organizations we're working with is uh, uh, an organization called Thoughtbox, and they kind of create an alternative curriculum for uh, uh, primary and secondary education largely. And um, Rachel, from who, who runs that, actually used quite a lot of the words in the run up to COP and created small projects for teachers to use within their classroom experience. And we're currently running a, a kind of testing ground project with them, if you like. So as a number of teachers have, have um, met with us, talked with us, looking at the material, and we're due to kind of keep that conversation going to understand how it can be more used and integrated in, in the teaching environment. But I, and the website is obviously quite well used, and I think when we've done talks, the, the response has been very positive. But I guess part of what we're do, doing now is thinking, well, how else can we take it out into the world? How else can we share it? How else can we get people to feel, touch, engage with, with what's here? So it's, it's still very much um, a kind of uh, a journey <laughs> <laughs> uh, for us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, question here. Hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to us about it, because it's such an interesting project. Um, I was just wondering how you went about connecting with the contributors, because it's got such an, an amazing reach, and some of the people you talk to, geez, they come from such different backgrounds, so I was just wondering how you went about that. Yeah, like 99% serendipity, <laughs> really. Like we kind of connected with different networks. So for example, there's a network called the um, e International Ecolinguistics Association. So ecolinguistics is the study of how does language or how can language convey like a um, um, positive environmental message. And there are people studying that um, and interested in that all over the world. Um, you know, randomly our Colombian partner came through, my friend who lives half the time in Colombia and is an avid bird watcher, and this is somebody that he knows on Facebook, and, and um, you know, he said, yes, I'd love to be involved, and became one of our key partners. Neville had a lot of contacts in South yeah. Africa. I guess when we set it up with, with um, British Council, we had two key partners. That's what we really started with. Uh, one in Colombia, and the, and the other one in, in South Africa. So quite a lot of the kind of the words and the initial conversations, I guess, were driven through those key partnerships. Um, and then others, as Philippa has suggested, sort of, yeah, grew kind of serendipitously uh, through connections and connections and lots and lots of conversations. And I think there were places we were hoping to, to, to sort of have words for 
COP26 and for our project, which haven't quite happened as yet for various reasons. I think sometimes once you've made the initial connection, you've really got to build a relationship and a relationship which feels reciprocal, you know, and that can take time with, with different partners and groups. Some people were very comfortable sharing, but clearly there were other people in, um, you know, perhaps in, you know, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, that part of the world where we're keen to connect but it's taken a lot longer to get anywhere near sharing a word. I think there's a lot of, a lot of mistrust still. There's a lot of kind of um, colonial legacy which hangs around and which people are anxious and mistrustful about. So they need to see how you're using what you're using. Is it genuinely a platform? How, how equal is that relationship? And those things take, take time. So I think, yes, some people really were quite happy and quick and shared really you know, willingly, others are still an ongoing process of conversation. And I think we'd very much like to expand that process. And I think as the project is built and, um, you know, people understand who we are and where we're coming from, um, then I hope those, those will grow. So it's, yeah, it's a mixture of things. <laughs> I wonder if I can ask a question back to you guys, like, because we're curious, you know, has anybody had an experience, like a, a digitally mediated experience, an immersive experience that has connected you in some way to nature or to something like, something that feels a bit kind of transcendent in some way? Yeah. Um, I haven't personally, but I uh, went to one of these talks a couple of weeks ago and there was someone who spoke about um, how they used virtual reality with people who are trying to navigate the disability um, kind of finance world. Mm. Um, and there was kind of an exhibition where um, people who had sadly not been able to navigate that world and had passed away. Um, there was virtual reality where people could like walk closer to these individuals and hear their story and walk away. And she was talking about how the audience um, or the users kind of acted in a way that she didn't expect where she was kind of people were able to kind of connect more and they were sitting down on the floor and actually um, kind of really paying attention to the mm. people. So I was uh, thinking about that throughout this and how mm. hearing these people speak about the words um, yeah. could help people to really relate. So I come from a linguistics background and I think language, like we can change things in policy and we can change things in the dictionary, but the dictionary kind of describes language in use and we need people to make those connections before we can change the language around how yeah. we speak about things. So yeah. I think using technology or virtual reality in some way would be really mm. important in creating those those feelings before we can change the language that goes along with that. Mm. Um, I think that's I a think really important point. Yeah. Actually hearing the voices of, the, of the, some of the people we spoke to was incredibly powerful and, and that's something that's, you know, we, love to be able to find a way of sharing. Mm. So that's a very it's almost point. like the kind of human library project, isn't it, where you sort of check out a person rather than a book and you sit and have a conversation with them. But I think that kind of quality of attention that you're talking about and the idea that you're, you're really sitting with somebody and hearing what they say, that's, that's a really beautiful idea. Yeah, thank you. I Any other? Say the, the, oh. the talk which was being referred to was by Sasha Wares. It's on our YouTube channel. You can watch that <laughs> right after this one. <laughs> <laughs> you just slip in an extra little promo there. Yeah, yeah there was a question over here. Um, just in response to what you were saying about digital experiences connecting you to nature, um, it was quite a few years ago now, but the In Between Time Festival that happened mm. in Bristol, one of the, I can't remember who it was by or what it was called, but one of the pieces in that was... Um, like being a group of people being taken to a park somewhere and we were like led into the woods and then everybody was given like a little roll mat and a headset and you were like instructed to lie down and like look up at the trees and then there was this audio for maybe, I don't know, it felt like a really long time, like 10, 15 minutes, which was all about the, the process of, of death and like what happens to your body when it decomposes and explaining all of the forces like wow. of nature that like the stages that happen and 
it wasn't really explained beforehand. Uh, like, it, there was, you know, trigger warnings or whatever, but it didn't go into detail beforehand of what it was going to be. And sometimes when I describe it to people, like, obviously everyone had different reactions, and it sounds scary, but I think my experience of it was, uh, it was kind of reassuring mm. and really interesting. And, mm. um, yeah, made me look at, you know, like, we're so, especially in terms of, like, gardening and nature, we're so obsessed with, like, tidiness and cleanliness and, mm. like, ooh, icky piles of leaves and then actually understanding, like, the purpose of worms and piles of leaves and yeah. foxes and things. And the circularity, I think that's so important. That it, like, death feels like a very, very important part of, of all of this, you know, and in a sense part of what's taken us... I, in my under, in my view, sort of so far away from nature is this idea that we can all we can live forever and we can just keep growing infinitely on a finite planet and that that reluctance to accept that there are endings and there are there's letting go things. So that's so interesting that you've you that that made that this project made you think about that and thank you for sharing it. Yeah, I'll go and look it up. Very interested in death and dying. <laughs> I think online would like oh. the the mic again. Uh, thank you. So, um, Sunny Online wants to say, uh, thank you, Neville and Philippa. I'm wondering if creating an AR experience that deconstructs our electronics, for example, and introducing the processes and journey of the metals used would encourage introspection. Wow. So, thinking about like resource flows in a way through objects. Um, yeah, you combine that with the death experience and you go through like the death of your mobile phone falling back into its constituent parts and traveling back to its places of origin. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. That, I mean, it's all bodies. It's bodies, not, not living bodies, but um, there's something about kind of just, yeah, coming into connection with all of these, these parts and things that we take for granted, I guess, um, you know, which includes how we live on the planet. There's something about... Yeah, sensitizing ourselves to to those processes. I think that's a really yeah, that's a really interesting idea. It would be definitely an, an obvious way into like a digital um, experience, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And what we've got one here. <laughs> yeah, just to um, just a bit of a diversion back into the language aspect. I had a couple of really quick questions and a slightly mm. longer one. So really quick ones. You might have said, but how many how many words did you end up with being contributed so far? Um, we sh 26, 26 okay. words. So it was kind of linked to COP26, and we thought we would do it like over okay. 13 weeks. In fact, we did it over like six weeks or something. <laughs> but yeah, cool. yeah. And how many, I was curious, how many of them were nouns in the end? Like, I feel like it's quite a natural thing when someone asks for a word to give them a noun somehow. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I haven't that? thought about that. I need to have a look. <laughs> I don't really think that's so interesting. Yeah, because some of them were kind of things that don't, like one woman shared um, a word, Tamposati, which means the people of the Tambo River where she lives. And uh, so it's, it's, it's like not a designation almost that we would have. I guess we'd have like a yeah, Bristolian or whatever. So yeah. Um, so it is both a noun and, and, a, and I guess, oh, God, uh, <laughs> like almost a verb, yeah, like a being. Yeah. being that. But even intrafilm on again, is that it's yeah. not really a noun, is no, it? No, I don't it's think so, no. no yeah, it's good. We'll, we'll, go and, we'll go back and have, have a look. We'll <laughs> revisit that. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, the slightly, slightly longer question was, I was just curious whether you'd um, considered asking people who might speak multiple languages in different scenarios, mm. who might speak one language with their family and a different one at work and a different mm. one socializing. Mm. Just asking them about their perceptions of how they use the different languages and what they feel they can and can't express or they can and can't translate mm. yeah. between them. I just thought that sort of comparative aspect from people who are really confident using several languages would be quite interesting. Yeah. Well, in part, we're sort of doing that with... with um, Philippines. Also. Yeah, with Aldrin. Yeah, so we're working now with, with one of our contributors um, from the Philippines. He, his home language is Cuyonon from the Cuyo Islands in the Philippines, but he obviously speaks, I mean, he speaks about five languages. But um, he, so, yeah, he, um, we could definitely explore those kind of ideas with him. And I, I was talking actually to Martin just before about people in, I met in Indonesia who speak like four or five languages and have a home language and a village language. And, a, um, and I think that 
And we were also talking about sign languages and how that also moving between spoken languages and signed languages, do they, do they cover the same territory in what, in what you can express through them? So yeah, super interesting things to explore that we haven't, that we haven't really delved into. A little bit with Teokasin because he was, um, he was brought up as a Lakota speaker and only spoke Lakota until he was, I think, three and a half and then um, was introduced to English. And so he's, you know, and that for him is like, it's a huge, huge wrench to move between the languages. And you know, quite often he said, in the word that we shared there, which is wiyukchan, it, it means consciousness or knowing, but it actually means the reciprocal relationship between the sunning and the treeing. And the kind of the the yeah the relationality of those two things, which is knowing, and and so when he talked to us about that, he was like, he was like, I have to use so many words in English to describe this thing in Lakota. That's a very simple idea, you know. And when you nounify, as we said, when you nounify everything, you kill it and you put these compartments in your mind. And so he spoke like quite viscerally about mm, like that yeah. experience of moving between languages. Um, he also described. Yeah. He said that. You know, the, the trunk of the tree is the same word as the trunk of a human being. You know, mm. It's one and the same. They're interchangeable, mm. Mm. which again was quite... Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Any more questions? Uh, I did have one myself I wanted to ask, actually. Yeah. Following on from that, like, when you work particularly with indigenous people, there's sometimes a tendency to, like, hold them up as repositories of ancient knowledge and so mm. on. And how do you balance, like holding people up as representatives of their culture with them as individual human beings with all of the mm. foibles and uh, <laughs> quirks that we all have. I, I guess with each, each, each community, with each person we spoke to, that, that's, there's a slightly different kind of balance in all of that. Um, so Sylvia Vollenhoven, so the first film, Shao, that we showed, um, she's uh, part San, Grew up speaking Afrikaans in South Africa. Obviously, works now and teaches in English. Um, you know, so you know, for, for her, language is entirely caught up with, you know, history, politics, apartheid. So th it's wrapped up in all of those things. I don't think it's and the, the language that she used, how is a now an extinct language effectively. Um, so I think, you know, her experience is not one which is necessarily, you know. Glamorizing, it touches on all sorts of quite difficult, difficult subjects and, and issues. Um, so, so they are very, very different. I'm kind of thinking also of Violetta, who shared that word. Who yeah, I think we really didn't want people to feel that they were standing there for their kind no. of language or their culture. They're, they're coming forward as a contributor, as an individual who is a language holder of a particular minority or endangered language. And um, I think, you know, it's, it is very easy to fall into a sort of trope of like oh isn't it all amazing and you know but actually many of these people are living in the most challenging circumstances where mm -hmm. you know uh you know industrial exploitative practices are coming like absolutely crushing you know their their um cultural um, heritage and their and their livelihoods and so you know we didn't want to tell like a kind of we, we wanted them to tell the story that they wanted to say, but they're really just standing there as themselves, um, not kind of trying to represent the knowledge of, of a huge group of people. Um, I think also yeah. the, the kind of other, you know, concerns, we wanted the project from the outset to be something which um, off, offered, offered hope, if you like, another way of thinking about our environment, which, was, which had a kind of positive outlook. Um, but also, I think in some communities, as Philip has touched on, it, it's, it was quite challenging. So with the Quay community, where we had words shared with us, which is in um, the Caprivi Strip in Namibia, if you like, um, they're a, you know, a, historically a hunter-gatherer community, which has been fenced in and fenced in and fenced in, and now um, are threatened with a huge amount of fracking in that area. So it's, you've got to balance, you know, um, the risks of putting that information up, which might threaten them even more, um, with you know, um, you know it, it's it's a kind of difficult equation. So how far they want to share, what they want to share, really needs to be determined by them, not by us. I mean, if we put up something about fracking in relation to that post and had kickback on them, it would be entirely inappropriate. So it needs to be them sharing, you know, as far as they feel able to share. It. Difficulties and challenges. Yeah. 
yeah. One last question one, from one online. Last. Wow. Or, I don't know, one last question. We've got time. <laughs> so actually, I think this is more of a, a response to the question that you asked of all of us. Yeah. So, um, Lena, to answer the question, online experiences, an event facilitated by new constellations, uh, Iris Andrews, for purpose disruptors comes to mind, involved introspection, future visioning, and relationships. Great. We'll look that up. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Last chance for any questions? All right. Well, I think if we're done, then I think if you'll all join me in giving Neville and Philip another hand. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much yeah. for letting us share with you. And participating so yeah, willingly in our <laughs> questions and everything. Thank you. Yeah. So before you all go, uh, if you want to stick around in Hot Desk today or find out more about what we do, then please come and find one of the studio team. Studio team, hands in the air. Uh, <laughs> we're a little thin on the ground today, but we'll, we'll, we will make time. Uh, if you're watching online and you've got any questions, drop us a line on studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions. If you're still around later today, it is First Friday, which is our monthly event where we celebrate things. It's not actually. Yes, it is First Friday. Yes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm monk <confused. laughs> uh, th th This week is Pride themed. There's going to be some work shown by studio resident Tom Marshman. We're going to have some tunes, going to have some drinks. It's going to be nice. Uh, thank you all for being here today. We'll see you all here at the same time, same place next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs>